Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. All right. Uh, welcome to the I Create Daily podcast. I'm Devani, and this podcast is for creators serious about creating their art. And I'm Leora Alderson, and our guest today is Jeff Goins. He is the very talented, best-selling author of five fantastic books, including his latest two and our all-time favorites, The Art of Work and Real Artists Don't Starve. In addition to being being an exceptional writer and storyteller, Jeff is also a public speaker, a regular blogger on his website, goinswriter.com, runs his own podcast, The Portfolio Life with Jeff Goins, and is also a teacher with his own course titled Tribe Writers. So welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you here. Hey, ladies. Uh, Good to see you again. Uh, Thanks for having me. Um, Happy to be here. (laughs) Yeah, great. So many in your audience, as in ours, are looking to make their art their livelihood. And that's what your last book is all about. And you know, you're passionate about that. But how did your art, let's, let's back up just a little bit with your journey. And if you could yeah. share with our audience how your art became your work. Yeah. So um, for me, just to be clear, you know, I think art, uh, the way I see it is your creative gift that you have to share with the world. So you could, you know, like make, you know, be like a bead maker or a baker uh, or a writer or an actor or a painter, a creative entrepreneur or a teacher. Uh, and if these are your creative expressions that you have to share with the world, then this is your art. Uh, for, for me, I just grew up always being curious about things and uh, making things, um, usually with my hands. And so I remember being six, seven years old, and I loved the comic Garfield, you know, the fat cat who eats uh, lots of lasagna. And so I started learning how to draw Garfield comics. And um, two years later, uh, my dad, uh, who was a guitar player his whole life, taught me how to play guitar, and I started a band, and I started taking these sad poems about girls that wouldn't date me, and I started turning them into songs, and so I started making music. Uh, I started Around the time I started acting, getting into plays, realizing I like doing this too. I like performing. Uh, in college, I got into public speaking, um, and really for me, I just like making things and sharing them with people and getting feedback on it. So when I graduated college, I toured the country with a band for a year. I quit the band and moved to Nashville, which is the opposite order in which those things tend to happen. (laughs) Uh, But I moved here to chase a girl who became my wife, and we've got two kids together now, uh, so that worked out. And throughout most of my 20s, I just kind of felt called to writing. I felt drawn to want to write more. And um, looking back on my life, I realized, oh, this is something that's always been a part of my life, whether it's writing songs or writing little comic strips. Like I like, I like the written word. I've always been good at English. And so I started blogging and I really liked it uh, because of all the stuff that I've been doing before, like, you know, for the same reasons. Like I like making things and getting feedback, right? And so whether you're playing a song or performing a play on stage, anytime I can do something in front of an audience and get some response from the audience. Uh, it's just, it's really exciting for me. And so, um, yeah, so I started doing that and I started working for a, a nonprofit around that time. And I just been blogging throughout most of my twenties and I learned about online marketing, uh, working at this nonprofit. I learned about online, online marketing because we didn't have any money to, you know, we didn't have a budget to, you know, market the services that we we're offering. And so, we had to find ways to do it for free. And so I started reading Seth Godin. He changed mm-hmm. my mindset about marketing where I realized it's not like lying and cheating and trying to get people to do things that they don't want to do. It's helping worthy ideas spread. And so I began to think of that more as, a, as an artistic, creative expression. And then ultimately, I was like, well, maybe I could do this for myself and launch my personal blog that you, you know, mentioned and you know, started an audience and started writing books and speaking and, and teaching. Uh, all of which I, you know, kind of consider uh, my art. But that's that's the story. Yeah, awesome. fantastic. Yeah. Now, um, you 
in your book, Real Artists Don't Starve, you talk about how you started using the word writer in mm -hmm. your description before as yes. your sign off, before you actually were. So, could, and that's, you know, so critical, I think, into your process as well. Would you like to elaborate on that? Sure. Yeah. I just think that activity follows identity. And so mm -hmm. I don't think you fake it till you make it, but you do believe it till you become it. Nice. And so for me, what that meant was like, I wanted to be a writer. I thought I could be a writer, but I just kept doubting myself and I kept calling myself a wannabe and an aspiring writer and all these things. And I realized it was um, like this was sabotaging myself. And this mm -hmm. was self-sabotage that was not leading me to do my best work. And I had a number of conversations, one of which was with a friend where he said, what's your dream? And at the time I was a nonprofit marketing director but I was doing this like uh, coaching program and I was, you know, getting feedback on, you know, both personally and vocationally. And one of the other members in the group said, what's your dream? And I said, well, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I have one of those. You know, I've got a job. That's like, that's good enough. I've got a family. Like that, that works. Right. And, and he's like, oh, yeah, sure. I guess he said, I just, I thought you would have said writer. Uh, and as soon as he said that, I was like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to be a writer someday, but that'll probably never happen. And he just looked at me and said, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. You just need to write. And I was like, oh, interesting. And a little while after that, I, I sent an email to Stephen Pressfield, the best-selling author of The War of Art and lots of other great books. Yeah. Um, but he was kind of like my idol, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I love that he thought about the writing process and everything in that book. So I emailed him. I asked him this question. I said, when does a writer get to call himself a writer? And he responded. And he said, you are when you say you are. Nice. And, yeah. and so I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to start calling myself a writer then. And uh, the truth was I was writing. I had been writing, uh, but I didn't, like, I kept waiting to arrive. I kept waiting mm -hmm. for the title when I get the official seal of approval. Uh, you know, Seth Godin says, you know, talks about, like, waiting to be picked. And I was waiting to be picked for the team so that finally I could, like, wear this badge on my chest that said writer. And that just wasn't happening. And so I was like, well, maybe I have to pick myself. And so when I began to call myself a writer, I started taking it more seriously. I started writing more regularly. And over time, I eventually began to earn that title. And so I think the way it works, not fake it till you make it, but first you believe, then you behave as if it's true, mm. and then ultimately you become it. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, you talk about that in your book a lot. And there was there was a quote I was thumbing through the um, Real Artists Don't Starve last night. And I'm going to butcher the quote because I am. I didn't write it down and I should have. But it said something along the lines of, of what you were saying. You become. You, you aren't. You believe an, and then you become. Yeah, you believe that you're an artist and that's how you become one. And that's yeah. just awesome. So, um. Yeah, so let me, can I ask, interject yeah. for it? we're going to kind of go off script here and um, because and go with the conversation. And one of the things I wondered about, so your first book was wrecked, correct? I mean, in other words, that's the title. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah. and uh, so like how did you, what, how long did it take you to write it? And it was, was it published in 2012? Yeah, I had two books published in 2012, and, and the chronology is a little bit wonky. Not that anybody cares, but basically, I wrote Wrecked first because I got a book deal, and then in between, when I finished that book and it came out, so like I turned it in like January and it came out in August of 2012, I wrote another book that I self-published called You Are a Writer, so start acting like one. Mm -hmm. so 2012, I so like the second book I wrote was the first book that came out. And the first book that I wrote was the second one that came out. But yeah, my first uh, you know, trade book was called Wrecked. And um, I think I wrote that, basically my practice is about 500 words a day. Okay. That's how I started blogging. I'd write a 500 word blog post and I'd publish it. I did it every single day for a year. I love this idea of daily creation. I think yeah. it's what makes a person uh, successful at anything is doing something small every single day to hone your craft, to get a little bit, better. My friend Sean West says, uh, before you quit something, you need to commit to doing it, something that you care about, you know, mm -hmm. like a business, uh, you know, uh, writing, any sort of skill. You need to practice it every day for two years before you expect it to succeed. Yeah. And uh, I, I like, I, I hadn't heard that yet, but that's what I was doing. Like when I started my blog, I was like, I want to do this for like two years. And my, the number I had on my mind was like 250 subscribers. If I can get that many subscribers, I feel like it'll be worth it. 
Yeah. Um, and so it basically took, you know, two years to get a book deal and, and kind of go full time, you know, with the writing thing. But I'd been writing 500 words a day for almost two years at that point. And so when I got wow. a book deal, I was like, how do I do this? And mm -hmm. writing a book yeah. felt like very intimidating to me. And I, I just broke it down. I think I got, uh, I didn't write it in Scrivener, but I did this. You could do this with Scrivener where you say, okay, here's the deadline. And then here's how many words this needs to be. And you know, the goal was 40,000 words. And then, and then it'll tell you, and you go, here are the days that I want to write. And then it'll tell you how many words per day you need to write. If you miss a day, then the daily word count increases a little bit. Nice. And, I, and I realized basically it would take me three months if I, you know, wrote five days a week, took the weekends off. If I wrote just 500 words a day, uh, it took me three months to finish the manuscript. And so I wrote the, my first book, at least the first draft of it in about three months. And almost every book that I've written, I've, I've basically done that. You know, I've, I've gone, okay, it needs to be 50,000 words or 70,000 words or whatever. Um, what if I write, you know, at least 500 words a day, how long will it take me to finish this? And it's always, you know, three to six months. Yeah. What I love about that is that you made the book writing part of a process you already had with your 500 yeah. words a day. I think a lot of people, um, myself included, we try and create this habit as opposed to saying, okay, well, how does my life flow currently and what do I need to do to make it happen? And you already had the, I need to write 500 words a day. That's non-negotiable for me. And right. so how many 500 words a day do I need to write to make this book happen? And yep. so, um, and, and that answers the question of what do you do every day? And it seems to me like you treat you treat your work like this is my career. I'm very serious and I am going to show up regardless. And so on the days where you don't feel like showing up, what do you do? What do you do to motivate yourself? What do you do to inspire yourself? Do you take a day off? What do you do on those days? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a great insight, Devani. Um, just like finding ways to take something big and lofty and working it into your process and, and just your life, I think it's so important because we see people who don't have our lives and we go, oh, I'd love to do what so-and-so does. Like I do this a lot. And I'm like, but they don't have kids. Right. They don't, they're not married and right. <laughs> not good or bad. It's just different. Right. You know? Or I look at my friends who don't have young kids. I'm like, why are you, how can you travel so much? <laughs> yeah. It's just a different reality. Yeah. I recently had to stop going to a gym that I was going to that I loved. I've been working out for the past 11 months, the strength nice. training class. I loved it, but it's from 6 to 7 a.m. every morning. And our son started going to kindergarten this year. And I was like getting up early, going and working out, rushing back. We had to be out the door by like 7.20 to not be late for school. So I got to like get him up. And my wife helps with this, but it's just like, it was stressful. I was like, I don't need my mornings to be more stressful. Mm -hmm. and, and, and after 8.30, my whole day opens up. So I had to kind of restructure some things where showing up for me, uh, like if it's, if it's hard to if it's hard to not, uh, if it's hard to do something that I really want to do, um, then like I've organized my life in the wrong way. And mm -hmm. so when it comes to saying, I want to do something every single day, I want to write, I want to exercise, I want to do whatever. I think as much as you can make it a, an automatic part of your routine, the better. So I stopped doing that class and I picked a class that has, um, uh, you know, workout times, all a different gym, different class. Uh, but it was something I had to show up for. And if I didn't show up, I missed it. But this one's at noon, right? So I go, I work out, I go to Chipotle and, and it fits into my lunch break, which is already something that's on the schedule. So I don't even have to carve out time to work out. Mm -hmm. I just got to go work out and then eat. Um, and so I think doing that is really important. On the days when I don't feel like doing that, um, I still get my work done because I just like, I don't think about it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. I, I get up every day and, and I write and I think part of the reason that that's automatic for me is because I have a system that allows me to not like, I don't get judged on the work that I'm doing today. I get judged on the work that I did yesterday or a week ago or a month ago. And so real quick, what that system is, it's called the three bucket system. You can Google it three bucket or maybe like my name and three bucket system. Uh, but I think a lot of people struggle with writing or any habit, especially writing, um, because they, they, they think it's one thing when really it's three things. Mm. And, and so for me, writing is not difficult because I parse those three things apart. 
And so what I mean by that is my goal every day is to fill three buckets and the buckets are ideas, drafts, and edits. Hmm. And so I don't know about you guys, but like I can't stop getting ideas. Right. Like I don't have like I don't sit down and have formal ideation times. I'm driving in the car, taking a shower. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I had an idea. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's bucket one. And so I don't have structured idea times. I just capture those ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And I put them in like Evernote and then I have a file of ideas that when it's time to write, I just pluck one of those ideas out of the idea bucket and I drop it into the drafts bucket. That's where I take my practice of writing 500 words, which is super easy for me to do because there's no pressure to publish that work today. So it doesn't have to be good. My only job is to grab an idea out of the idea bucket and drop it in the drafts bucket. Uh, now I've done this many days, you know, in a row as so I have lots of drafts in the drafts bucket. I have no system. There's no chronological order. I simply reach down into the bucket, you know, figuratively speaking and pull a draft out and go, yeah, I'm going to edit this today and get it ready to publish. And so I think when we talk about writer's block, uh, typically we're talking about fear. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, really, I think at the root of it is we're afraid to, like, we've got to come up with a great idea, we've got to write it, and then we've got to get it ready to publish all in one sitting. We go, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, is because it's not one thing, it's three things. And if you pull those three things apart, it just it becomes kind of this blue-collar task where you go, I show up. I do this, I do this, I do that. Uh, and most days, it's a pretty easy process for me because I'm just, because there's no pressure on each of those steps. Like I don't have to come up with an idea and then publish it. All I have to do is move uh, something from my brain into the idea bucket, something from the idea bucket uh, into the drafts bucket, something from the drafts bucket into the edits bucket. And I've, I keep doing that every single day. I never run out of ideas. I never run out of things that I'm working out and I, uh, working on, and I never run out of pieces to publish. I think that's a great practice, and I think what that also does is because a lot of people in our audience, they they have a day job, whether that day job is their own business that they're working on mm, and yeah. doing any creative hobby on the side, or a day job as in like a nine to five. A system like that really, uh, because we're so conditioned to like show up to somewhere and do work, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that puts you in that mindset, but instead of doing work for the man, you're doing right. it for you. And so you're showing up for you. And so yeah. you need that type of schedule of like, okay, I'm doing the idea thing or I'm doing the writing thing or I'm doing the editing thing, not, and I have to have this big grand project done today and published at five o'clock. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it, it's like you're creating your own assembly line mm -hmm. and, and you're wearing all the different hats but like when you change hats, your job changes, you know? And so um, like, I'll, like I'm coming up with ideas throughout the day. That's just kind of an organic part of my day. And I just, I'll just like go, oh, hang on a second. I'm going to write this down real quick, you know? And wherever I'm at, you know, whether I'm at, you know, I'm out to lunch with my wife or at church or, you know, in a meeting, uh, for the most part, like I, I'm, I have the freedom to pick up my phone and just type it in real quick and then set it aside. Because I've done that thing where like you get an idea and you go, I'm going to remember this. And you don't remember yeah. it. Yeah. And, and my wife, you know, my family for the most part understands like these ideas are the way we make our living. Yeah. So it's okay if, you know, I need to take like seriously five seconds, write it down and then come back to it later. Um, but yeah, yeah, my job is to just move one thing, you know, from each bucket. And I never, it's never the same thing. So um, I'm never uh, translating idea to draft to edit. I'm, I'm taking a draft that's from yesterday or the day before. So it's kind of let it sit with me and then I'm editing, getting it ready. And I mean, I think that's so important for people um, that, you know, realizing most creative acts are not one thing. Mm -hmm. They're a series of different things and you can kind of create your own assembly line and go, okay, this is, this is my ideation time. This is my writing time. This is my drafting time. Uh, this is my editing time, you know, whatever uh, your, your process is. But pulling that stuff apart so you only have one thing to do for each step, I think will reduce the amount of procrastination and resistance you experience. That's an excellent point. Uh, when you were talking about, and you guys were talking about the, um, the accordion and flexible nature of a schedule, what came yeah. to mind was essentially words in the same way that we can change words and paragraphs you know, to fit and to suit, but the, the overlying theme 
is still there. We can do with our day as we need to. Yep. Um, when you were talking about the different hats that you wear and the editing process, are, so are you doing it all? Are you taking your own articles from beginning to completion and publishing now? I am. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. There was a season where I experimented with outsourcing that and uh, I, realized, I realized what I do uh, as a, a writer, speaker, teacher is, is a bit more uh, artisanal and, and a little less of like building an empire, a little less imperial, I guess. And, and, and that's what, like I have friends who have more empire structured businesses. And what I mean by that is you are, uh, you're the face of, of the business, of the brand, whatever, but then you've got people that are kind of creating this stuff for you and you're the spokesperson. I experimented with that for a while as I was trying to scale this information business and I just didn't enjoy it. In fact, one day I woke up and I realized the one thing that I got into this business to do, which is writing, I had outsourced and I had in fact exchanged it for the one thing that I really didn't want to do, which was manage people. Interesting. And so I was like, hey, I'm the boss. Like I'm kind of in charge of things maybe. Yeah. And so I said, no, no, I want this. This is mine. Yeah. And right now, uh, I feel like I've right-sized my business. I don't know if this is something you want to talk about. I think this is important, especially for yeah. makers, yeah. creatives. If you're yeah. going to build a business around your art and, and you really got into this to make this thing and you don't want to necessarily give all, like, all the control of that over to somebody else because it's your craft, it's like you do it your way and nobody else can do that, then I, I think you need to get in your mind like, what is big enough? Like what is the right size of this business, this organization that makes this work? For me, it wasn't being a solopreneur because uh, like I'm, I get lazy about doing things. Like I don't like routines. I don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Like even being disciplined to write has been a struggle. Uh, I like, I like what that process yields, but like initially creating it before it became kind of a mindless activity, that was a struggle because I don't like routine. Uh, so you know, kind of where we settled is a team of just a handful of people where I get to do my one thing, which is writing, coming up with ideas, casting vision, uh, and then everything else, like the team is small enough that I don't really have to manage a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all pretty self-managed. And then the different roles on the team are basically things that I do not want to do. Responding to emails, dealing with schedule, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, customer complaints and things like that. Uh, organizing projects, you know, anything that requires organization, I'm not good at. And so I, I outsourced the things that I didn't like, but kept the thing that I did, which is writing. Yeah. That's so important. And you posted something somewhere on the social media platforms yes. uh, out there in the world. You were talking about um, just kind of, you had mentioned something about comparing and how this comparison thing can be such a um, it's, a, it's like a double-edged sword because you want to look up to people who you, who inspire you, but right. at the same time, you don't want to get into this, oh, well, they're doing this thing and I'm not doing that thing and right. maybe I should do that thing, but then that doesn't necessarily take into account, well, what are your strengths and what do you enjoy doing? And was there any point when you tried like being the face of your company where you kind of got into... Um, looking at everybody else doing that and thinking, Hey, maybe I need to do that. And so was that a trap for you? Was that, was that a struggle or was it just you wanted to scale and you wanted to experiment? It's totally a trap. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think as great as it is that we live in this um, uh, time of history where like people are more transparent with their lives and businesses and, and work than they've ever been. And there's, there's something really good about that. Like, just to be clear, like, it's amazing that we can get, like, the person watching this is getting a free education, you know? Mm, yeah. uh, the person that's listening to this is, is, you know, hearing stuff that maybe they've never heard before, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so that's incredible, the access that we have to people's lives and businesses and the way they think and work. Uh, there is a shadow side to that, which is the fear of missing out, the anxiety of not doing enough. And I, 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 yeah, I did post something a while ago. I don't know if you're referring to this or not, Devani, but uh, basically, like, I realized, um, like, 
if I like whenever I go to the internet looking for somebody to invalidate what I'm doing, <laughs> like obviously like that's not the conscious reason why I'm doing it, but like subconsciously, I'm like, huh, I wonder if I go on Instagram and feel crappy about my life right now. <laughs> I always find what I'm looking for. Right, it yeah. never fails me. <laughs> and, and so I, I mean, I realized that like I, I am looking for like some reason to feel bad about the work that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And, and I was just like, this is not a fun way to live because I could always find somebody who's doing better than I'm doing. In regards to the comparison thing, um, it was a big trap for me because I would see what somebody had uh, without acknowledging that the, the work that they did and the risks that they took to get there. Uh, so I remember talking to uh, an, uh, an older couple in our church who were good friends of ours and um, they were like in their 80s at the time. We went over to their house, a really nice house up on the hill in, in Franklin, a nice area outside of Nashville. And um, the older, the, the, the patriarch of the family, the man, um, he had designed the house. He was an architect. Mm-hmm. He, had this, like, he was from the greatest generation. He was an Italian-American. Uh, he spoke Spanish, English, and some Italian. Uh, he fought in World War II. Uh, he was an architect and an engineer, and then and then, and then when he got to like age sixty, he's like, I want to be an inventor, and he started inventing things, and he had like twenty um, patents. It just this is an incredible guy, and um, and when he was seventy years old, he tiled on his hands and knees the the bathroom in, in our church, um, and so just this incredible dude. And we were talking to them about um, I, I like money or something. I can't remember how we got on in this conversation. But they said, you know, we've noticed something about our kids who were like in their late 20s, early 30s at the time. Our kids want what we have without realizing it took us 40 years to get yeah. there. Mm. And, and the, the wife, uh, Madeline, said, um, she said, you know, um, and, and, and the scary thing is they can do it. They can have the same house. They can have the same things. But they have all this debt, whereas like we spent time paying cash for these things because you know it wasn't commonplace to have you know all this credit card debt and stuff. And I think the same thing is true when you look at whatever somebody with you know an entrepreneur with a ten or twenty million dollar company, and you go, I want what they have. Mm -hmm. And as I have begun to befriend some of these people that I look up to, I go, I want what you have. But now that I understand what you did to get that, you know, for example, a friend of mine runs a software company, and for like three years he didn't pay himself. And, and and had to invest fifty thousand uh, dollars into the business just to get it going, yeah. and now it's a fifteen million dollar company. But I mean, he didn't pay himself for three years. Yeah, right. you know. So when you begin to understand what people did to get to where they are, you're able to make a better decision. And and, and it, I think the reality is there are just some things that we actually don't want once we consider the process, and that's not bad. Like I realized I don't want a big company because I don't want all the things that it's going to cost me. And from a business standpoint, like I realized this does not like, this is not a tweetable, like this does not go on an inspirational poster. But what I really want is to make more money than most people doing less work than most people. Uh, Like, which like, I mean that, that is like, you're not gonna like, I don't know, do a Ted talk on that. But like, that's why I started the business. I wanted to have more freedom uh, and I wanted to make a better income than I would working for somebody else. And then I wanted to be able to use that freedom to write books and spend time with my family and live the rest of my life. Well, that automatically is going to exclude me from growing an empire, you know, because I am intentionally not working more than blank, you know, 20, 30 hours a week. And there was like, there was a while I felt really mixed about that. And I just realized like, this is what I want. This is what's going to make me happy. And, and I think, think sometimes we think we want something and then we get that thing and it doesn't really make us happy. You didn't mm-hmm. really want that. You wanted what that, you thought that thing was going to yeah. give you. Yeah. Freedom, status, satisfaction. And, and I, I believe that we can be content with wherever we are in life, but there's nothing wrong with wanting more. Like I want my house to be cleaner. I want a little bit more financial security so our kids can maybe go to college. You know, there's certain things that we go – if I get this, like I'm going to feel a little bit okay uh, with my situation. And I think the hardest part, especially about being an entrepreneur, uh, is to really get clear about what you want and then to pursue it and not worry about what other people are doing because you don't, you don't know what it's like to be them. 
Right. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that's an excellent point. Um, and it's hard to do that if we're spending so much time looking at what other people are doing. So it's uh, so along those lines, it's like as as creators and people who already have your own following, your own brand, your own books, your own tribes, you spend a good bit of time serving your your students, your tribe, and interacting with your own community. But at the same time, as a learner, um, always seeking to improve yourself, you probably still also consume other people's content, you know, and, and hopefully consume it in a way that doesn't make you feel like, you know, you, you haven't achieved because you have achieved so much. But, you know, so that's the other side of monitoring what other people are doing, and that is learning from them. Just like we read your books and um, blog articles to learn from you and are always inspired by that. Um, so how do you balance uh, consuming versus creating in that regard. It sounds like if you're working 10 to 12 to 20 hours a week, rather that, you know, that you have the time to do both and that that's part of what you crafted for yourself perhaps. Yeah. So, I mean, to be clear, when I'm not working, I'm like changing diapers and <laughs> right. wrestling a five-year-old. Yeah. 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 Um, so any reading, writing, you know, uh, creative time or consumption time typically happens during that, you know, five hour work day. Um, so it's about a 30 hour work week. There's like, I don't work on the weekends. I never work at night. It wasn't always this way, but it is now. Um, and uh, to be honest, like I don't read a lot of blogs. I don't listen to many podcasts. Uh, I'm very focused on books right now. And it's like, like, I feel bad about that. Like, I'm like, I should listen to more podcasts because everybody's talking about podcasts. Um, and, and I'm like, well, podcast or book? And I feel like I'm almost always going to get more value out of a book. Like, I just, I really believe in books, you know, and I know it's easy to listen to a podcast or read a blog post, but I love what Seth Godin says about books. He says a book is a deep dive into a single idea or story, mm -hmm. and you don't get that with, it, with other forms of media. They're all about, it's got like, you know, quick bite-sized yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I will tell you what I do is I will typically pick one or two people and I will study what they're doing in, intensely. Uh, like, okay, you've got an event and you've got a blog and you do podcasting and I will really try to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. Because that's another thing is you, you see people doing stuff like, oh, I should do that when you like, I should have an event. And then you realize, oh my gosh, like it's expensive and yeah. hard and they have an event because they sell software and they're just trying to get people to come to get them into their, you know, funnel or whatever. I don't have that. So why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really like understanding why somebody does something can disabuse you of this need to keep up with the Joneses. But I like doing that. Like I like, like I'm doing that with podcasting right now. I want to do better with my podcast. And so I'm picking a couple of people uh, to sort of apprentice me in the art of podcasting just informally. Like, I'm studying what they're doing. I'm reaching out to them. I'm asking, why are you doing this? How's this working? Tell me more about this. Um, yeah. Again, going back to the comparison thing, because I just think it's, so, it's such an important topic and people waste so much time doing this. Just be super careful with that. Because uh, I have done stuff based on what I saw other people doing only to find out that like that thing lost them money or made them miserable. And on the surface, it looked like a smart idea and you go level deeper, and it wasn't. Example, I, early, early on, I remember seeing a friend um, like do a promotion for his book. He's like, first, first 100 people to buy my book, I'm going to review your blog for, you know, for like a bonus. And I was like, I should do that. And I did it. And, and like I posted, like, I'm going to do this. And then I, and I met this friend of mine who's a well-known author and speaker, and he said, that was the worst thing I ever did. I was like, no. <laughs> and he was right. It was a bad idea because it basically put me on the hook for something that I like. It, it was a commitment that I wasn't able to fulfill, and yeah. I mean, it was a bad. And it created a job for for yourself, yeah. which is exactly yeah. why you did not get into this business, <laughs> not to create a job for yourself. Yeah. So I mean, we just like we see what people are doing without understanding why they're doing it or what it's really costing them, uh, or like sometimes. I, here's the other thing: like people are lying. People lie about their success. We did, you know, eight figures this year. Really? That was you great. Did? Like, show me the P&L. Yeah. Like, I don't know how much money I made last year until October of this year. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. Uh, and entrepreneurs have no idea. Like for the most part, small business owners have no idea what their finances actually look like unless they've got a degree in finance and an MBA. Like they, they don't know. I didn't know. I had to hire somebody to take care of that. That's the other thing is I just go, they're probably lying. I'm just not going to pay attention. And even if they're not lying, it's helpful to me to just assume they are so that I don't have to compare myself to them. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, you, so how do you balance creating content for your blog versus your books? In your writing schedule and not only excuse me but not only like the timing uh, in the daily structure but also deciding because your blog is free consumption for anyone who and it's a it. good blog you're and a very good writer yeah <laughs> definitely yeah you're definitely the writer so yeah so how do you like decide i want to i'm going to put this all on my blog for free i'm going to write this article versus what i put in my book and you know do you separate them yeah i mean the audiences are a little bit different. They've started to overlap over the years, but initially like I had a book audience and I had a blog audience and the blog audience was very much writers and creatives. And so I was talking a lot about my process on the blog and that typically led to, you know, courses and events and teaching people about the process of writing and making a living writing and how to do that. Um, and then the books were just more like ideas, things that I experienced and then lessons that I learned as a result of those experiences, over time, they've kind of become more, you know, enmeshed uh, intentionally because I didn't want to be talking to different audiences. Um, I think, I don't, I don't think that way. Like, I don't like create something for the blog or create something for, for the book. Like I said, I, I mean, I can show you my, my folder of like all these like half written or quarter written ideas and I don't know where they're going to end up. And I just go, I like that idea and that idea might be an article or it could be an entire book, or it could be a chapter. And so I'm just constantly hoarding ideas, uh, you know, articles, pieces, you know, snippets. Um, but then I also have a deadline. Like every week, I have to publish a new article. And so when the deadline comes, I go to my bucket of published, you know, edited pieces, and I go, which of you wants to live? You know, like, what, like, what am I going to bring to life? <laughs> you mean you want more? <laughs> yeah, and it, and it kind of is that way. And there's a little bit of intuition that goes into it. I just, I'm like, I think this this is what people want to hear right now. And then, you know, I think the decision process is: is this something people need to hear right now, or is this an idea that a year from now uh, will still be relevant? And if it's a year or two from now, then that may be something for a book. Because if I start, if I put this in a book today, it's gonna people are actually going to read it a year from now. But yeah, to, I mean, the short answer is I don't really parse those. I'm just, you know, constantly translating ideas into drafts. And then what I do with those drafts really depends on the piece. I was talking to Ryan Holiday about his uh, process. He's a very prolific writer. He writes in all these different places, the New York Observer and Thought Catalog and on his own blog. And I said, how do you decide where to write what? Yeah. And he said, it just depends on the piece. Like I'll write a piece and then I'll figure out where it needs to go. Where it belongs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, that's kind of how I think. Yeah. That, it, speaking of writing and the ideas, your book titles are all amazing. I mean, it's like oh. you have somehow come up with just the perfect titles and book covers. Like, mm. how do you do that? Is that a pro Do you name them yourself? Um, do you spend much time on them or do they come first? The titles come first. What has been your process there? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I can't take full credit for that. I've named some of my books, not all of them. Um, uh, there's five books. So first one was You Are a Writer. Um, that title came first. A whole book was based around that idea. And that came from a talk that I did. A friend of mine who had had a bunch of success self-publishing an ebook. She made like $40,000 in two months. I was like, how do I do that? <laughs> yeah. and, and she said, you need to have a great idea. And she said, when you, I saw you speak at this event and when you told this audience of writers to call themselves writers and like I made them do it, I made them like tweet, I am a writer. She said, that was powerful. I saw all those tweets. I mean, it was incredible. So she said, you should call book, the book, you are a writer. Uh, and I was like, oh, cool. You know? And yeah. so uh, and I wrote the whole book around that idea. Um, Racked was based on something that I had been um, uh, was was based on basically something that I wrote that was like an online manifesto that I turned into a full length book. And so you know that the idea came first, and the title came first. Uh, the in between, um, 
uh, was um, something that my agent gave me. He, um, I, can't, I, I wanted to call it a beautiful pause, I think, or something like that. And it's basically a book about waiting and all. And he says, you, he says, you should call it the in-betweens, like mm -hmm. these little moments. And I said, I'm going to call it the in-between, you know. And um, that's how that came about. And then The Art of Work was another one from my agent. Um, great guy. Shout out to Marco Stryker. And, and then the last book, Real Artists Don't Starve, uh, speaking of Ryan Holiday, I had let him read the book early on. He'd given me some help with the editing. And he says, you need, he goes, you've written two books. Um, you've written a book about creativity, and you've written a book about why you shouldn't be a starving artist. And you have, kind of have to pick which mm -hmm. book this is because it's not, mm -hmm. not clear. And there's a lot of books about creativity. There's not a lot of books about how to make a living off of your art. And, and we, I was like, oh, I, want, I said, I want to do the thriving artist. You know, I want to do the, the, the starving artist book. And um, he said, uh, he said, cool. You know, we were just talking about the idea. He said, you're kind of saying like, oh, I don't know. It's kind of like you're saying real artists don't starve. And I was like, yeah. And, 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 well, that's you know, exactly it. <laughs> so all that to say, it's kind of an organic process. I typically start with an idea that's interesting to me. I'm like, what, like, why is it that all these creatives I talk to assume that you're going to starve if you're a creative professional, an artist? And, and, and yet I keep meeting people who aren't starving. Hmm. It's almost like if you believe you're going to starve, you will. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so I started with that idea and then just kind of start writing around it, researching around it, and then ultimately. But at a certain point in the process, I feel like naming it is important so that like, uh, not every author is this way, but I think this is important that like for a nonfiction book, like the name is like the brand of the book and that brand should be woven all the way throughout the book. Yeah, that makes sense. I, was, I prefer audiobooks just because I spend so much time at the computer that I like to be able to read more, you know, while I'm doing other yeah. things. Me too. Uh, walking, whatever. So yeah, so I've been listening to the audio book, um, uh, Real Artists Don't Starve. And mm -hmm. you're, you remind me of Malcolm Gladwell's writing. He's one of our favorite authors as well. And your, yeah, the way you tell stories is so engaging. And I, I wondered, where did you, like, did you conduct interviews with, you know, so many of the people that, whose story you tell? Did you conduct the actual interviews? I know one person you spoke about speaking with him, but for the most part, I mean, obviously Michelangelo, you didn't, but <laughs> <laughs> the guy that, that get, did the work and the, and the delving into history for Michelangelo, you did, I think, or may have. Yes. Um, yeah, I spoke to all those people, um, typically multiple times. Um, that, that was something that was just interesting to me. I love Gladwell's work. Another guy who does really well at that is James Surowiecki. He's another New Yorker. Uh, writer, great storytellers who are taking interesting ideas and they're wrapping stories that you, that I, you know typically we haven't heard before. And you go, wow, that's really interesting, and they're teaching you something through that story. Um, I like that, uh, and I like writing books that I like reading, and so I wanted to try that. I tried it with the art of work, kind of learned how to do that, and then uh, you know tried to do it better with this book. Um, but for me. Typically, I kind of cast the net wide. I go, hey, are there any story? Did, do you know anybody who's a full-time creative professional or an artist? Uh, and then I'll get, you know, people say, I am or I am. And then I'll make them, I do a, a, like some sort of online survey where they answer some questions just to kind of qualify them. Mm -hmm. And then I do an initial Skype call or phone call, at, which I record. And then I go back and review that and go, you know, is, this, is there something here? Is this not only... Uh, a good story that proves the point, but is it interesting? Is it surprising? Is it going to engage the reader? And then if it is, I basically go back to them. I ask them some follow-up questions, really get their whole story. And what I found, I, especially when I did this with the art of work, is I would get somebody's story and then I'd go back and they'd retell it and they'd tell it differently and they missed things. And what, like, it takes hearing somebody tell their story a couple of times before they start telling you the whole truth. Mm -hmm. Not like they're trying to deceive you, but like anytime you're interviewing somebody, there is the risk that they're telling you what they think you want to hear yeah. versus saying, here's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as, as readers, we know like the most interesting thing is like, I just want to know what happened. You know, if it's an interesting story, cool. Um, but that, I mean, that's been my process is like, I'll do some sort of survey, multiple interviews. And then, and then often I'll like follow up and email them and like fill in details that I forgot to ask about like what year did you graduate high school or you know whatever yeah. fantastic awesome. yeah. well um in terms of thriving artists what are the few things uh that you do in in your day in your week in your business of 
creating your art to thrive? Um, I, th- th- these aren't like scheduled things. Um, but a few years ago, um, where like, I was just trying to find like a rhythm as a writer. And cause like, basically for me, I would like make a bunch of money, then make no money, make a bunch of money, then make no money. And so it was really hard to find a rhythm, you know? And so I'd like make a bunch of money. I remember like I quit my job and this is never, this has never been the case for us, but I quit my job, uh, in, at the beginning of 2013 and like, I don't know, a week or two after that, my wife came out uh, on the, you know, I was on the back porch. It was like you know, nine o'clock in the morning, you know, drinking my coffee, just, you know, chilling. And she came out and she was holding our newborn son. She said, Hey, I just looked at the bank account. We're good. And I was like, what do you mean we're good? She's like, we're good to the end of the year. We don't, we don't have to make, like, we've got our bills paid for the end of the year. And like, we had been month to month, you know, for a while. And this was March, you know? So she's like, you don't have to work. If you don't want to, you have to work for the next nine months. And I was like, what should I do? <laughs> Again, this was just very new to me. I wasn't used to having this much freedom. She's like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Do whatever you want. I'm going to, you know, raise this kid. You, you, you do what you want. And like, it was like the, one of the worst things that could have happened to me. Wow. I'd go for walks. I'd call friends, giving them unsolicited advice. And I mean, I'd <laughs> for months. <laughs> just trying to find some way to be useful. And so I realized, first of all, money can't be the driving force for me. There's got to be something more to it than that. And I, need, I needed something to anchor me. I needed a practice. So in terms of thriving, answer your question, there's three things that I try to do about at least once a week. Uh, and I think if you do these things, they all kind of feed each other, kind of like the three bucket system idea. So first I do something to build my craft. And I do this daily. I write every day. And I typically read every day. Stephen King says, if you want to be a better writer, read a lot, write a lot. And I think that's a pretty good, simple formula. So I do that every day because I want to get better. I want to get better at telling stories. I want to get better at coming up with interesting ideas and just better at you know, entertaining and inspiring people. Uh, second, I do something to build my brand. So interviews, you know, I uh, typically do those uh, for like an afternoon, you know, once a week where uh, people will interview me. Uh, or I'll write an article for somebody. I'll do something that's marketing. You know, do something. Sometimes speaking. I'll do something to get my work out there. But the idea is, at least one thing a week, I'm trying to build, like trying to do something to build the brand. And then third, uh, about on a weekly basis, I am thinking about what can we do to build the business. So what's a project that we're working on? Uh, you know, are we building something? Are we getting ready to sell something? Are we going to do a promotion? It doesn't have to happen every week, but I'm doing something every week to move that ball forward. And, and those three things on a weekly basis, I think are very important. Build your craft, build your brand, build your business. If you, if you do one small thing every single week to move those forward, mm-hmm. you're always going to be getting better, which means you're always going to be getting uh, more attractive to your audience, which means you're always going to be growing your brand, therefore growing your audience, which means you're therefore going to grow your business, uh, you know, and, and, and get more money that can feed everything else. And so it is kind of this virtuous circle of uh, the better I get, like the more people I'll reach, the, you know, the more I can charge, the more money I can make. Uh, and that goes right back to allowing me the opportunity and freedom to get better, to grow the audience, to grow the business. Yeah, no, that's, that sounds like you're writing your concept. You know, it sounds like very simple and yet very effective in the, in the consistency, persistency mm-hmm. and discipline. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. But back to your, you know, like essentially feast or famine, like making a lot of money or not right. making a lot of money with your books. And I, I know you had some of the exposure and background to marketing from your previous nonprofit job. Yeah. But you did have some books that did better than others, and certainly that's the biggest problem for most, uh, you know, most people essentially who are seeking to publish their books, whether it's through a publisher or self-publishing. The marketing, so much of it, is still upon them. Yep. And as you know, when when we had dinner a couple of years ago at FinCon in Charlotte, and uh, you know, I shared we shared our kind of like rebels, you know, in terms of being you know out of the box in the way we do things and off, you know, yeah. and not in the mainstream. You know, mm-hmm. along those lines, I, I t- tend to rebel against the system of having mm-hmm. to buy reviews, you know, for your books oh. and for Amazon mm-hmm. and that sort sure. of thing. It's like, you know, is that the only way, you know, even some authors, according to Ryan Holiday, um, kind of buy their way into the New York Times bestseller list. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, is there, you know, back to 
transparency and light and truth, you know, are there, you know, what is your process of, um, of succeeding at getting your book sold and, you know, marketed? Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Um, uh, first of all, uh, it was very important to me at the outset to not solely rely on income from my books. First of all, because I didn't think I could. Like, I didn't think I could make a living writing. And so I was like, I'm going to have to have other ways of making money. So I started the online education business, teaching you know, online courses. And now we do events and some coaching. Uh, really as a way to supplement whatever income I could make off of my books. I did get to a point where I could probably live off of royalties, but I like that I don't have to because it, it gives me the freedom to write a book that I believe in, knowing full well that it may not sell as well as a, a book that um, you know is, has more mass market appeal. You know, and you past two books, very interesting you know, sort of case studies. The Art of Work is a book about finding your purpose and calling. Lots of broad reach. Best-selling book to date. Real Artists Don't Starve. It hasn't been out as long, uh, but isn't selling as well as that book sold. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, I'm proud of both of them, and they're doing very different things in the world, reaching very different groups of people. Uh, so I do think it ultimately comes down to, like, what do you want to do? And and like, really, like, really, what do you want out of this? Do you want to sell a certain number of copies of book books? Do you want to be acknowledged as, um, uh, you, you know, like, like a, a legitimate authority in this area? Do you want your peers to think you're cool? None of these things are wrong. We just have to like be really honest about what we want. And I think right or wrong, good or bad, what I love most uh, out of everything that I do, honestly, is somebody coming up to me and saying, I read this book and it changed my life and here's how. And I'm just like, hmm. I can't believe this. Because as you guys know, when you write a book, when you write anything, it's kind of a, it's a lonely process. You're typically by yourself. You're putting it on a computer screen, into a book or onto a blog. And like, like you don't see the person reading it. You know, going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, like, I'm speaking to you. I see you nodding. If like you got, if, if your eyes were closed, you know, I'd be like, oh man, I'm losing it. I've got to do something. But you don't know when their eyes close in your books. Yeah. And so when somebody comes up to you and said, hey, like I paid attention. I heard you. It's just incredibly validating. Quick anecdote on that is I was speaking at this local event um, a few weeks ago, I think, uh, and it was at a country club and it was like this like uh, women's society thing. I'm real, real big with the women's associations. Apparently, um, you know, it's like it was, it was a group of you know older women who um, you know get together once a month for for lunch, and I got to speak there. And I'm speaking to this you know audience. We're talking about art and passion and things like that. And this waiter comes up to me, and he says, "Hey, are you Jeff Goins?" And I said, uh, "Yeah." And he he said, "The same Jeff Goins who wrote this book, The In Between." I said, yeah. Uh, he goes, man, I love that book. It was, I read it at my college library. Like, it really helped me make sense of the season mm. of life that I was in. Wow. I was like, wow. Here I am at an event promoting another book, and somebody's coming up to me telling me that this, this book impacted them. Now, here's the thing that he didn't, doesn't know about this, is that was my worst-selling book. Mm. That, was, that was the book that I wrote. I was like, if I just write a good book, it's going to sell. And I, and I like was very lazy about the marketing because I put so much into the creation process and, and I was disappointed with it. And I kind of moved on and then wrote The Art of Work and it was this, you know, bigger, you know, bestseller. And so I think the reality uh, of the work that we do is um, if, if we are in the business to create hits, man, that is feast or famine, that's live or die, it's stressful. I was reading an article that, you know, basically says John Mayer, is coming back, you know, out of you know, out of the the shadows, and has come back into the mainstream. And he's got this new book that he he hopes is his next hit. And like, what must that be like? Yeah, you know, to be John Mayer, be mega star, kind of have a couple of records that you know weren't like on the radio all the time, and then, and then have this pressure say this is going to be a hit. Maybe it will be. I think my job, our job, is to create a body of work that we believe in that uh, is satisfying whatever goals that you have and, and it's not a very objective way it's not very measurable but if I keep writing books if I keep paying my bills and I'm able to write books some of which do better than others and I think 
sometimes your more popular work pays for the rest of the stuff that you do. And that stuff's still valuable. Yeah. Um, but if I can create a body of work that I believe in and, every, and, and people keep coming up to me and saying, hey, I read this and, I, and it changed my life, I go, wow, like I'm good. I, 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 and I know that sounds sort of, I don't know, Pollyanna, but like truly when somebody says, I read this and I did it and I took it to heart, I go, this is, this is more amazing than I ever could have anticipated sitting on my couch with a you know, $300 Dell laptop computer going, I wonder if anybody's going to read this. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's- I think I love that because it, it gets back to, it's like when I feel like there's almost two stages of your purpose or your passion or your why or whatever you want to call it, your calling. I know you call it vocation. And there's the stage of like when you start and you're doing it for you. And yeah. it's like, this feeds my soul and that's why I'm doing it. And then there's the part where you gain this momentum and then it's like, and now it's my responsibility to do this for you too, because you are satisfying the need to do it yourself by showing up every day. And so then you're kind of leveling up according to the goals that you want in your life. And now the goal is like, am I touching people's lives showing up too? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, were you going to say something, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, just on that, like, a friend of mine is a very successful songwriter, has this sort of counterintuitive idea. He says, you don't know anybody your talent. And I think that's super interesting. And he, and we both have, we both know this guy who's a songwriter who just was like mega superstar. I just quit. He just, I mean, he hated writing songs. Wow. And now he, now he sells windows for a living and he loves it. And he's wow. super happy. <laughs> and so, I mean, yeah, like I do feel a responsibility to touch people's lives and, and that whole deal. But the minute that I'm not loving doing that, like, I'm out. I'm going to go do something else. Um, life is too short to do stuff that you don't like. And I think I, I, I am my happiest when I'm doing stuff that I love and other people love it too. Excellent. That makes a lot of sense. And in closing, because we've taken your time and we could speak with you all day, but we're going to have to let you go. But in yeah, closing, I mean, looking at the past five or six years, look at all that you've accomplished. I mean, really, it's amazing when you think about it. You know, the podcasts, the books, the courses, the tribes, the community, the speaking. It's really quite a body of work in just five or six years yeah because you kept on going so have you had or would you like to share any thoughts about what you're hoping for the next five or six years yeah i mean i think my metric uh is um my metric has has become sort of um my new metric is interestingness Uh, i mean like I'm not, I'm, uh, yes, I think about success and, but I, I mean, like success is kind of boring in the sense that like in order for you to make more money, reach more people, uh, there is this tendency to like water it down, make it more vanilla. And if I have to choose between popular and interesting, hmm. uh, like I'm choosing interesting over the next yeah. five years. Nice. Like, I, like just, I mean, think about your favorite author. Think about your favorite musician. Like think about your favorite creator. You're not thinking about, I hope, I hope they make more money off of this record right. than the last one. I yeah. hope they go multi-platinum. You don't care about that. You do care about the quality. Yeah. You know, I don't care if John Mayer has a hit. Is, does he have another great song that I'm going to enjoy? Yeah. Whether or not that's commercially successful, I as the consumer don't care. And so I'm thinking more along those lines. Like I want to do work that people that were reading me five years ago are still going to be engaging with the next five years. And like we've all followed people that haven't done that, right? Like you love how raw and uh, vulnerable they are. And then they get a little bit of success, a little bit of popularity and, and they, and they lose themselves in that. Just, just like, you know, like uh, the popular kids in high school, which I was never a part of, you know, like there is the tendency to sort of lose yourself in the yes crowd and say, I'm going to do stuff that I know people are going to agree with because I don't want to take risks. And I, I hope, I mean, as simple as it sounds, like I hope that the legacy that I leave with my work is simply he, he did interesting work. You know, it made us think differently about yeah. life and creativity and, and the work that we were doing. And I don't think you do that by doing more of the same. I agree. Yeah, that's fantastic. A great note to close on. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us, Jeff. 
and your wisdom and knowledge is incredible and very helpful for aspiring writers and creatives of all kinds. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, always great time to hang out with you guys. Uh, thanks for, uh, for letting me be a part of this. Okay. Bye-bye. See ya. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.